thinking about over the last, you know, the span of my lifetime of getting to live in four nations, all the adventures that he's been on. It's just been incredible. And uh, I just wanted to share one really quick. And that was, we were in the, we were in the Comor Islands, and um, he was an engineer that was called in with some doctors because when the Comoros got their independence, France, France basically, they, they just ended up pulling everything out. So the hospitals weren't functioning, railroad systems. And um, so in the end, we ended up, um, in the end, we, we, we went in and, and everything was in chaos. And the Lord, uh, he had just been filled with the Holy Spirit and the Lord was giving him wisdom and the doctors would point at a broken x-ray machine and say, fix it. And he would have to go in, just the Holy Spirit would give him words of knowledge, uh, e exactly where the circuits were on this. And uh, I heard, heard a story, uh, I think his brother shared it or something like that, but uh, it was just last year that uh, he got a call to the base that the other islands had been protesting and that they didn't want independence, I guess, and there were riots and uh, the, the, the army had been called out and a person had been shot on one of these islands. And if this person died, it would be really, really bad because the main island was the one that wanted independence. And so it was just a crisis tipping point for, for all these island nations. And so my dad got the call to his phone to, to wake up the doctor and get the doctor down to the airport because things needed to happen quickly. They needed to fly him to this island. Uh, and it, it had been a gunshot wound to the chest. And so it was pretty critical. And so he, uh, he called the doctor. The doctor said, go ahead of me. Um, you know, I'll be there in a couple minutes. So my dad went ahead to the airport. They looked at my dad. They shoved him in, in the back of an old World War II DC-3. And they said, you'll do. He said, the doctor's not here yet. They said, you'll do. And so when they threw him in the back and they closed the door, they took off and they flew over the island. And when he arrived, he said that it was like a sea of people, of, of, of rioters and protesters, and they body surfed this injured person over the top uh, to, to, to the door of the plane. And uh, like I said, it was, a, it was a gunshot wound to the chest, so all he knew to do is just put pressure on and, and you know, compression on the wound and just pray a lot that this person wouldn't die because this would affect uh, all, the, all these island states. And so as they, as they went to start the plane, they couldn't start it. And so they got a fire truck, and they weren't perpendicular to the plane, and they wrapped the fire hose around the propeller of this old World War II DC-3. And they took off at a perpendicular angle, hoping to jump start the engine, and they were able to. And the whole time, he had his hand uh, hoping that this man would live. And as they flew and landed, not only was he alive and the doctor was able to work on him, but, uh, but um, the, those, those nation states stayed together. So I just, I think it's fun when you hear a story that should be a book or a movie, but would you just welcome a man who's lived an incredible adventure? And, uh, and why don't you, yeah. So they've, they've both served together, like I said, in four nations, and uh, we're going to put some pictures together and celebrate it, but uh, next week is their 50th anniversary, wedding anniversary. So we're going to show some pictures. They're actually gone, but we'll, we'll have a little, little celebration when they come back with some fun stuff, so get ready for that. But. I just wanted to say, if any of your marriages need encouragement, give us a call. <laughs> <laughs> Here, Phil. Oh, give you that. Fuck him down. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it is. A couple weeks ago when I spoke, I was about 70%. I'm almost 100 now, which is really good. So... Uh, yeah, we're both getting stronger. We're getting our stamina back and just glad to be where we're supposed to be in this moment. So, oh, Jesus. So, Father, I just thank you right now for the worship, for your presence. Oh, we have such a hunger to draw into your presence and know your face. So walk with us as we share this morning. 
We just ask that you'd open our hearts to the truth of your word. In Jesus' name. We are starting a series this month. We felt like the theme of this month was to be truth. And so I get the first launch of, of that particular theme. And we want to we dive into this. And today, uh, the, the kind of month theme is uh, truth is in Jesus. But today, I want to very specifically deal with the spirit of truth. If we don't have a relationship to the spirit of truth, we won't actually find truth. And so there's a relationship with the Holy Spirit that we want to really present today and, and, and look at very carefully because it, it, the search for truth is not going to be found in all the sources we look at. It's going to be found in the face of Jesus when we get into his presence. And the Holy Spirit's role is to reveal Jesus to us. And when we understand that role, then we're going to begin to hear truth more clearly and see things more truly, more clearly. I want to start this morning in Isaiah chapter 59. It's a, a great passage. It says, our, court, our courts oppose the righteous, and justice is nowhere to be found. Truth stumbles in the streets, and honesty has been outlawed. Uh, could that have been written last week? Um, isn't that an incredible statement? This is, this, is, this is the foundation in Scripture. This was Isaiah speaking. Uh, he uses that, that word, truth has stumbled in the streets. And it, it's a great word. It's a great word. It, the word, Hebrew word actually means truth has weakened because of decay. So, so literally it was something, but decay got in. And it was so weakened by decay that it can no longer stand up. So, so truth was there, truth was known, truth was understood, truth was heard, but somehow decay got into that truth and now truth is stumbling. It can't stand, it can't stay upright. Could have been our day. The context is that all this is happening. In Isaiah, the context was all this is happening because we forgot God. In other words, that, 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 that everything is in this state because God has gotten forgotten. And uh, it, it actually, he, he makes the statement in the same chapter that we've isolated ourselves from his presence, his power, and his blessing. We, we, we've literally forgotten who he is to us. And I was wanting to go somewhere from this point to really look at our society and the, de the decay that's in our society because our society is in crisis and we really have forgotten what truth is. And so I want to go to a really unusual place to start this. I want to go to the writings of an atheist. Tom Holland is a British historian. Uh, he's fairly well known today. Um, even those who disagree with what Holland writes would say it's the best research historical facts that exist. So he just, what he does is incredibly well researched. And in 2016, Holland actually wrote in an interview, he, he said that he, would, he needed to repent because for all of his life, he was raised by an atheist father, Anglican mother. For all of his life, he believed that the morality of Western civilization came from the Romans and the Greeks. But in his research as an atheist, he came to realize that the morality was a direct result of the Christian influence on the warring barbaric tribes and that Western civilization, using his words, Western civilization came about by the gentling of warring tribes. This is an atheist speaking. <laughs> it's actually one of the best defenses of the Christian gospel spread. He would no longer associate himself as an atheist, but he would still, that's kind of his main 
group that he speaks into and relates to. He wrote a book called Dominion, How the Christian Revolution Remade the World. And, and in that, in his book, he talks about the way as Christianity invaded these, the, these, the, these pagan, incredibly violent tribes, that the state of women was transformed and they were brought into a place of, of wholeness in the society. He, he talks about how sexual desires were tamed and it was the Christian influence that brought sexuality back into marriage and out of just anybody you want to release this on. He talked about the way that infanticide was so normal in these tribes. Any disabled child was immediately killed and it was the invasion of the gospel that dealt with infanticide. He talks about the way that the state of slaves was absolutely transformed because the gospel invaded a treatment of people. This is an atheist talking. <laughs> In May this year, May 19th, he wrote a blog which has received a massive amount of criticism. But in this blog he said, Christianity may be necessary for the survival of Western civilization. We've forgotten God. We have roots that transformed, and yet we've drifted so far away from that foundation. Winston Churchill makes this statement in a meeting. He was talking about the invasion of Normandy, and he actually made this statement. He said, truth is the most valuable thing in the world. Truth is the most valuable thing in the world. The context of that statement was, he was talking about the war. And he said, he said this, warfare is the art of getting the enemy to believe a lie. Warfare is the art of getting the enemy to believe a lie. Turn to your neighbor, say, you're the enemy. To the evil one, you are the enemy. To our enemy, the devil, we are the enemy. The art of warfare is to get the enemy to believe a lie. We are in a challenge as a church that if we're not careful, we'll buy into a lie that disables us from doing what we're called to do. World War II, before Normandy, months before Normandy, there was a, there was a campaign of misinformation sowed into the German army. They actually built dummy armies and they built planes out of plywood and they, they positioned these armies in the north and the south and they, they just flooded Germany with the, the view that the invasion into Europe was going to come either from the north down or from Gibraltar up. They even got look-alike generals and sent them to those two parts of the world so that the German spies would see the British generals in those areas it was so effective that when Normandy invasion happened, Hitler waited seven weeks waiting for the invasion from the north and south before he pulled out his troops and sent them to back up Normandy. The lie won. I really believe we're in a point in the church where we got to be really careful where we find the truth because we can be defeated when, if we're deceived by a lie. Not a great theologian. 
but a guy I really enjoy. Keon West said last week, media spins the truth to distract, to discredit, to dismiss, and to destroy. The lies are being sowed to distract, to discredit, to cause distrust. And if we're not careful, the, the context of that statement was that in an interview, he was asked about abortion, and he actually talked about he and his wife struggling with whether they were going to have an abortion for their first child. And he actually began to weep in the interview. And he said um, he was weeping at the thought of his firstborn being avoided, and they decided not to do it. The media took that and has presented him as mentally unstable because someone would weep at the idea of abortion. Oh, God. We're so twisted the truth that it's not the truth anymore. There's always a little bit of truth. Every lie has a little bit of truth in it. Every lie has that little kernel and Unfortunately, everybody takes that kernel and spins it to whatever they want it to say. It's time for us, the body of Christ, to step up out of that. We desperately need to know the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. We've got to ask the Holy Spirit to help us see the difference in these two. In John chapter 14, verse 17, Jesus says... He, the Father, will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. So we have an advantage and that advantage is the presence of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, who carries truth from the heart of Jesus. We have an advantage. We have an advantage the world doesn't have. It's pointless to rail at the world for their inability to speak the truth. They don't have the spirit of truth. But we have to be a people that, that guard our hearts and speak only from that spirit of truth and, and understand what's coming out of the heart of God and not just picking up the, the, the static that's coming from the right or the left. It doesn't matter if it's conspiracy theories or pro progressive ideologies. They're both volumes shooting information at us. And if we're not careful, that becomes the truth. We have a spirit of truth. And we've got to learn to trust and function in the spirit of truth. When Jesus was standing on trial before Pilate, he makes a statement to Pilate. He said, I came to bear witness to the truth. And they went on in the very next verse to say, uh, John chapter 18, he went on the next verse to say, that everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Everyone who is of the truth, hears my voice. So truth is the search for his voice, not for the search for information in the environment we're in. I remember many of you have been around when Y2K happened. It was crazy. And being a leader of a church in Y2K, was, it was a circus. Because almost every believer and most of the prophetic voices were prophesying doom and gloom and all kinds of crazy stuff. Sam Matthews and I talked just before that and said, listen, we've, we've got to hear the truth. So we called four of the kind of prophetic people that work in our team, and we actually paid for them to go up to a cabin in Colorado with no internet, no, no television, no news media for three days. We said, you guys go get before God for three days and come back and tell us 
how we need to respond to Y2K. They came out of that time of isolation with the Holy Spirit, and they told us exactly what they heard, and it was exactly what happened, down to the two places where there were computer malfunctions. I mean, it was a specific word came from the Spirit of God. Amen. The response in our church is most of our prophetic people left. Yes. I'm going to stop there. Yes. We've got to know the difference between the Spirit of truth and the Spirit of error. Pilate responds to Jesus and says, what is truth? But then he doesn't wait for the answer. He immediately goes out and washes his hands and said, I find no fault in this man. He didn't ever get to the truth. The world doesn't get to the truth through rational thinking. It doesn't get to the truth through the process of, you know, trying to judge this thing correctly by all that's going on around us. We get to the truth by the presence of the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth. We need a relationship with the spirit of truth. You know, we live in a world that does not have the same reference point of truth that we have. And if we're not careful, we get angry at their lack of reference point instead of modeling as a people of God filled with truth. We've got to learn the difference. We've got to understand the difference. Our society has become so afraid. We're so caught in a virtual, unreal world that we don't even know where to go for truth anymore. And, and we've become afraid to call evil evil because it, it, it will offend somebody or it's not politically correct or we have all of these energies coming against the truth. And in the middle of this, the church is trying to figure out what to say. Because just about no matter what you say, you're going to be accused by somebody of being wrong. So the best thing is, let's find the truth and say that, and at least we'll be crucified for the truth. Give me a bottle of water. I didn't bring one with me up here. Higher education has championed the idea of critical thinking. where you begin to question everything. And it, when you question everything, you lose the truth in the process of questioning everything. It's not that, I, it's not, I'm not against critical thinking. I believe, I mean, some of the best teachings on truth will come from Francis Schaeffer and Ravi Zachariah, who, who, who just, I mean, they, they dig into that rational thinking and bring rational conclusions. We never should be afraid of the mind. But the mind's got to be surrendered to the spirit to find truth. Rational thinking alone doesn't bring it. You know, science is very necessary. We're constantly bombarded with the science is settled on this. The problem is science without faith doesn't lead us to good, good, good conclusions. Science is necessary. Science is important. It's important that we understand the science of something. But science alone isn't going to produce truth. It produces information. A Harvard professor Lee, Mc, Lee McIntyre made this statement a couple years ago. He's an ethics professor. He was actually speaking to a group of students about another grouping of people. And the grouping he was talking about is those who believe in intelligent design, those who are anti-abortion, those who still drive vehicles powered by fossil fuel, those who doubt the man-made influences on our environment. And he said this of them. He said, we have entered an age of willful ignorance. I actually think he was prophetic. I might not agree that he was directing at the right group of people, 
but I think you're making a true statement. That we've entered an age where whatever we choose to believe or whatever we feel becomes truth. And we've so dumbed down the idea of truth, it's become incredibly, incredibly hard to find truth. You know, fear has distorted both sides of the argument. Whether it's a fear of a virus or a fear of a conspiracy. I was looking for a really good quote on fear and I was having trouble finding one so I, I picked a really profound person to share a quote. It's one of the few pieces of decent information on Facebook. A fear baseline produces a really bad track record of predictions that time and time again have been proven wrong. I, I, I couldn't have said it any better. It, it's just, it's really important that we understand that, that, that if we're going to find truth, we've got to find truth from the Spirit and not be fear-driven or not, not we've got to cleanse those other motives from ourselves because if we're operating on those motives, we will not find the truth. It's distorted by all the noise. And I mean, I, I've never been in a time where there's so much noise. I mean, there are times I have to go in the front room of my house and lean back in my chair and just quiet all the noise so we can begin to hear the Spirit, begin to fellowship with the Spirit. John 15. We were in John 14, jump to John 15. When the Helper comes, who I will send from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. So the nature of the spirit of truth is the spirit of truth talks about Jesus. The spirit of truth gets into Jesus' heart and, and, and reveals truth to us. There, there's a bunch of different verses we're not going to go to, but verse 16, 14 says that when the spirit speaks truth, he gives glory to Jesus. There's a glory of Jesus that happens in that act of the spirit revealing truth. The reason at Dayspring we give so much time to worship is we want to still the noise and we want to get into the presence of Jesus and we want to sense his heart and feel his heartbeat and be in touch with the spirit of truth so that that interaction changes us. Your worship experience is going to be directly proportional to how close you get to his heart. If you're not pressing in and worship to see Jesus, you're missing the point of worship. Because the act of the Spirit revealing Jesus is the act of the Spirit of truth at work, which brings us in touch with Him and then releases through us the truth that we can only find in His presence. I, I, for every one of us in this room, there is a desperate need to press into worship so we can contact and touch the spirit of truth. It comes in quietness. From a place of intimacy, we're going to find the truth. We're going to touch truth. Bill Johnson said this, if you have more input from the mainstream media than from the word of God in this season, your discouragement is self-inflicted. <laughs> I... Just, I think he nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. I, I mean, we, we, much of our time on the phone is dealing with discouraged believers. Who, if they would press into his presence, would no longer be discouraged. Because they'd be empowered and envisioned by the things God's doing in this moment. We're in the greatest moment in all of human history, and yet it's so easy to be distracted by the stuff going on around us. All the noise, all the noise, all the noise. Verse 16, uh, chapter 16. But when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into a little bit of truth. 
just enough to keep you through. I wonder what all means. I wonder what all means. What does all mean right now? In this moment in our society. What does it mean to so engage with the spirit of truth that he guides us into all truth? I don't spend a lot of time looking through Facebook and I don't comment much on the things I see because if I commented, I'd let my flesh get into my comments and then that wouldn't work well. But I am just staggered by how Christians make comments based on what they've heard yes. with no foundation of truth. That's happened on both sides. We get caught up in the current political arguments instead of being a people of God that press into his presence and power. In the verse just before this one, Jesus made a statement. He said, I have many things still to say to you, but he, when the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all truth. So the implication was that there are things going to happen in the life of believers from the point of Christ till now that required the spirit of truth to speak into them because those things didn't have a reference point for Jesus to share them at that time. That means there's no circumstance you're in today where truth is not available to you. There's no circumstance we face where if we'll press into the spirit of truth, we'll have access to the presence of Jesus and we'll be able to speak the truth. When you're in a society where everybody lies, everybody distorts the truth, everybody spins it to fit their narrative. Where do you find truth? Only one place. Pressing into the presence of Jesus and drawing life from the spirit of truth. Now the problem for the church is that in the Reformation, which were all products of that period of Reformation, the reformers, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, that, that, that whole group of reformers, were faced with a lot of superstition. They were faced with a lot of things that had invaded the church which were not correct. They, they, were, they, they were faced with this kind of barrage of false supernatural, which caused the reformers to then begin to speak of the Spirit as only having one role, and that was the conviction of sin. So those of us born out of the Reformation have been taught and grew up in a society where the Holy Spirit isn't speaking about the current situation you're in. The Holy Spirit only convicts you of sin. Go convict those people of their sin, but we're not willing for the spirit of truth to rise up inside of us and cause us to be a people of truth who speak the truth and live the truth and, 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 and who change society because the truth is in us. What happened was it began to steal the very power of the gospel that had changed those warring tribes and literally brought peace into a warring groups of tribes. That gospel that had permeated all of those areas uh, uh, north, north of Europe and had literally brought warring groups together into a cohesive Western civilization. We then stole that Holy Spirit out of it in the Reformation. And said, really, what he only does is convict. And from that point, we see an age of reason. We see other seasons coming into the church where other things establish what the truth is. Because we don't trust the Holy Spirit to take us into his presence and speak. Get yourself into worship. Get yourself into his presence. 
and allow the spirit of truth to speak into where you are and so release truth into you that when you walk out of this building, you walk out of that time of worship, you become a carrier of his power and his presence and his revelation. And when you open your mouth, the sick are healed, demons flee. When you open your mouth, things are changed around you because the power of the Holy Spirit of God is releasing truth through you into a society devoid of truth. He, the Spirit of Truth, comes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. We got so focused on the canon of Scripture, and I love the Scripture. Everything I do to the best of my ability is founded in Scripture. But the canon of Scripture isn't the whole of what God wants to do in your life. The Spirit of God is alive in you to give you direction. Amen. Alive in you to lead you into how to respond in difficult circumstances. Trust the Word and the Spirit. The great, some of the greatest prophetic words about this season we're in right now is that when a people of the Word and a people of the Spirit come together, we will see the greatest move of God in human history. It's not just the Word. It's not just the Spirit. If you have the Word, you'll dry up. If you have the Spirit, you'll blow up. But if you bring the Word and the Spirit together, there's a living life of God that reveals Him power and presence into this season. We need to be people of the Word and of the Spirit. It's not one or the other. It's not abandoning something to be something. It's allowing the Word of God to so reveal the power of the Spirit. If we don't elevate the Holy Spirit past conviction, then what happens is our personal experience causes us to set with the truth. Causes us to decide this is truth. Well, it's easier for me to believe this than to believe that. What I feel, what I want, becomes the truth. My opinion becomes the truth. It's the Spirit who testifies. First John 5, 6. I just want to give you four areas these are not exhaustive. These are just the four that I felt this week as I was preparing this. I almost didn't put this part in because I, the focus was on the spirit of truth. I think we have to start applying this idea of a lie to how we understand truth. It is the spirit who testifies because the spirit is the truth. <laughs> 1st is morality. The lie is that morality comes from reason birthed in tolerance. Our society is driven by a morality birthed in tolerance. God wouldn't do that to people. We need to treat it. It's, it's all this thing, but, but underlying morality, there's a lie we bought into that keeps us from the truth. The truth is that morality comes from the non-contradictory nature of God. It's rooted in the nature of God. Morality is rooted in who He is. And, and we don't go to the current thinking to find morality. We go back to the nature of God. You get to the nature of God by trusting the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus, who is the nature and character of God displayed into the earth. And so when you trust the Holy Spirit in a current modern day situation, if we trust the Holy Spirit, he will take you to Jesus, which is the heart of God, and release that heart into you and through you, and now you can walk in the truth. There's a desperate need for the church 
stand on the unshakable nature of God. And let truth rest there and not in what feels convenient or politically correct. A second big lie that's in our culture is accountability. The lie says everything we do that's wrong is somebody else's fault. Got to find somebody to blame for it. The truth is that we're each accountable to God for every thought, motive, and action. If we're not careful, we skew this just a little bit and we begin to accept a little bit of the lie because it feels correct. But the lie is always the lie. The lie is always a distortion. The the lie will always lead us into bondage. I was captivated by one section of what Holland wrote. And it was the change in the treatment of the slaves when the gospel came in to those pagan, warring tribes. I thought, God, we need to go back to the power of the gospel to change behaviors. I'm not saying there isn't race. I'm just saying the gospel in its correct truth has the power to change society. The third lies compassion. The lie, the lie is that love somehow nullifies biblical truth. Well, God's a God of love. He wouldn't do that. How many times have you heard that? How many times have I heard that in the body of Christ? The truth is we've got to love those who have beliefs contrary and even hostile toward us. We have to love them. That's, That's a requirement. But love the triumphs is always unapologetically attached to the truth. I don't have time to do this today. Maybe another speaker this month will do it. But there is a, there's a huge body of Scripture that ties love and truth together. And, and we have desperate need for love and truth to come together. I, I got to the end of preparing this message on Wednesday or Thursday this week and realized that every Scripture I used from the New Testament was from John. who was loved Christ at a level where it's commented on. And yet the one who loved Christ at that level speaks the most about the spirit of truth. That would be a whole message in itself for somebody. Incredible. Revelation, the more you love me, the more you're going to speak the truth. That's why we're to speak the truth in love. These two are tied together. The fourth lie I want to touch briefly. Oh my goodness, I'm out of time. Is eternity. The lie is that the natural realm is all, all we have. This is our existence. The truth is that we're spiritual beings and God put eternity in our hearts so that we could live from an eternal perspective. So in the midst of the chaos going around us, I, I, I loved Christie's statement last week. It was just it was a profound statement. God cares more about you individually and what you do than he does about our nation. Now, I love our nation. I believe in our nation. I believe that God is going to use our nation. I believe revival is coming to our nation. I do believe that. But he's much more concerned about your heart than he is about national interest. And we've got to be people that have eternity in our hearts so that we live and think with an eternal perspective and don't get trapped and caught in the natural. Let me just finish up in two minutes here. 
you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Good old John again. <laughs> you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We're, every one of us is searching for security, for meaning, for belonging. But it's time to change the channel. Instead of our channel being set on all the noise coming forth, we need to set the channel on the spirit of truth and engage more and more and more and more and more time of worship with him. I've always been fascinated by Heidi Baker's life and the fact that in the work she was doing in Mozambique, every time she went to God for more anointing, he asked for more time in worship. And she ended up worshiping hours a day and producing more in the time she had left than she ever thought possible. But that's because you engage with the spirit of truth in worship, and then you can come out of that in the power of the truth, in the power of the spirit, and you can see transformation. Are you ready? We need the spirit of truth if we're going to address the problem of evil in our society. We need the spirit of truth if we're going to pursue racial justice. We need the spirit of truth to understand the nature of real love. We need the spirit of truth so we can access forgiveness. We, we, everything you do requires the spirit presence of the spirit of truth. So as we go through this month of just looking at what the truth is, and I haven't, I haven't tried to define truth today. I've, just, I've tried to get us to think outside of our understanding of where truth comes from. Because if the body of Christ will get their truth from the spirit of truth, we will see a transformation of society unlike anything we've ever seen before. Amen. There's a time to stand up against injustice. There's a time to protest things. But those times have to come from the spirit of truth, not from our desires. I love much of what I see around the nation right now is the body of Christ is grappling with when do we protest and when don't we protest. It's a really good grappling. But the monitor of that has got to be the spirit of truth, not what's convenient, not what we like or don't like, but what's the spirit of truth saying? And when you listen to the spirit of truth, you're going to walk into a season of incredible release and power. You should have communion in your hand. If you don't, would you just raise your hand and somebody will get that to you? If you don't have a, one of the cups, just there's a couple of hands in the back on this side and a couple over here. One down, all the way down the front here. Sal, give her the extra one. I brought a couple extras because sometimes the front row doesn't have. Yes, Jesus. Truth is in Jesus. As we celebrate this morning, we're celebrating the body of Christ. We're told, and uh, this, I could get distracted really quick. I need, I can't do this. We're told that the Holy Spirit baptizes us all into one body. It's a spirit of truth that baptizes us into Jesus. That's the first of the, doc, the multiple baptisms. The first baptism is by the Holy Spirit as an act of conviction bringing us into Christ, into the body of Christ. Then there's a baptism of water that, that deals with our old nature and brings us out into the new. Then there's a baptism of the Spirit where the Spirit comes on us and we're empowered to do the thing. There are at least three baptisms in Scripture. But the, this first baptism is by the Holy Spirit baptizing us into one body. <laughs> so Lord Jesus, this morning, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that has baptized us into one body, that has baptized us into the Lord Jesus. We celebrate you this morning, and we give you the liberty to cause us to behave more and more and more like the body of Christ. And we receive that together now in Jesus' name. And we're told to not forget the blood. There's actually one passage that talks about the blood being that first baptism. Both Old and New Testament. 
It was the blood that separated us out from under the law and brought us into the law of the spirit of life in Christ. We've been brought out of a set of rules into the law of the spirit of life in Christ. If you want to walk in truth in this hour, you need to walk in the law of the spirit of life in Christ because the spirit reveals Jesus to us. The spirit reveals the heart of God. So, Father, we thank you for the blood. I'd like us to just stand up together. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the blood, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the blood that broke us free from a set of rules and ushered us into a life of the Spirit ushered us into a place where the Word and Spirit work together to reveal the heart of God so that we always know what we need to do next because of what He's done. So we celebrate you this morning, Lord Jesus. We celebrate you with everything in us. We celebrate your blood. We celebrate the liberty. We celebrate the new covenant. And we thank you that your blood has cleansed us. In Jesus' name. Let's take it together. Now, as we're standing, I just, I want you to ask you a question. If you've struggled with all the noise coming at you in this last season, whether it's media from the right or media from the left, whatever it is, if you've struggled with all that noise coming at you and you found it difficult to find truth, would you just put your hands up with me right now and I want to pray with you. Father, I thank you for the honesty of the people in this body. I thank you for the willingness to grapple with the real issues of our day. And Father, we just right now release the spirit of truth to begin to move in each of these hearts right now in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come and release your truth in the midst of the craziness, in the midst of the conflict, in the midst of competing voices, in the midst of contradictory information. Father, we don't know what to believe sometimes. But Lord, lead us into truth so that your truth becomes the bedrock that we stand on. Father, forgive us for buying into the lie. Help us to understand that warfare is the art of believing a lie. And our enemy has sought to have the church believe in a lie, to disempower them. And we just break the power of that lie now in Jesus' name. And we release the power of your spirit to work in us and through us, to cause us to become everything you've called us to be. And we declare that in Jesus' name. Amen. If we could have a couple of ministry team people down the front. We're going to close up here in a minute. And if you have children next door, we're going to release you to get them. But I believe there's a couple people in this room that your mind has been so filled with the various voices that you found it very difficult to keep your mind straight. And if you're in this room and you've struggled with your mind in that way, I'm going to ask you to just be real brave and come down the front and let these guys pray with you. We want to see the breaking of the power of that confusion, the confusion of thoughts that has just really captivated and captured the church. I want to just bless the online audience right now. This morning is one of those interesting times, and I don't put any motive on anything, but literally just as worship broke out today, 
the internet blocked our access. And uh, so we've recorded it and we're going to upload it. It will be online, but those watching online weren't able to watch live today just because of the craziness of this. Who knows? I don't even try to put a motive on it. But if that's you, just come right now. Father, I've just blessed this body of people now in Jesus' name. We bless this body, every man, woman, and child, as they go out this morning. They would be a carrier of your truth. That would be, they would be a carrier of the spirit of truth. And that they would begin to see great breakthroughs because the truth has a greater strength and hold in them. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have children next door, this would be the time to go get them. If you need prayer, please come down. I just believe there are several others that need that. Uh, we love you guys. We celebrate you. You are a blessing. Amen.